This is the weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmith. 50 years ago last night, Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot on the moon. 19 minutes later, Buzz Aldrin joined him, and the anniversary of Apollo 11 is sparking memories from the millions who watched it happen on TV to the astronauts who actually made it happen. Anchor Matt Austin has the story of the third Apollo 11 astronaut, Michael Collins. The fact that I did not walk on the moon to me was really kind of superficial. I felt that I was a, a, a full third partner in the venture. For Michael Collins, the mission of Apollo 11 was clear, complete President Kennedy's goal. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. That was a wonderfully uh, simplistic uh, mandate uh, that helped us a lot in our preparations for, uh, for going to the moon. We knew exactly what we were supposed to do. For Collins, that meant piloting the command module known as Columbia, separating from the final stage of the Saturn V. Then, the complex task of turning Columbia around to dock with the lunar landing module helping set the stage for the most famous touchdown in space history. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. A task Collins says could only happen if everything went according to plan. Well, the daisy chain, that's what worried me. The idea that in order to have a successful moon landing, you had to have a series of relatively minor events, each one of which was successful. If one of them was unsuccessful, the whole scheme went down the drain. But as Armstrong and Aldrin worked on the surface, Collins spent the next 21 and a half hours in solitude, worried he may not reunite with his colleagues, but not bothered by the fact that he was alone, 238,900 miles from home. When, for example, I was behind the moon and not quite knowing what was going on, uh, I, I was asked after the flight, weren't you terribly lonely, the loneliest man in this whole lonely mission in the lonely history of this lonely planet? Weren't you lonely? And I said, no, not at all. I was happy. Now, 50 years later, as this nation prepares to return to the moon, Collins says that should serve as a stepping stone to what he believes should be the main focus. I thought NASA should be renamed the National Aeronautics and Mars Administration and... Uh, and, and I, I bring that notion with me over the past 50 years. I'm still looking for Mars, and I'm, I'm thinking it's getting closer. And for the anniversary of Apollo 11, New 6 dedicated an entire day to space, remembering the past and looking towards the future. Eric Von Inken traveled to California to check out some of the new companies looking to get in on the New Age space race. This is what a modern-day, cutting-edge rocket factory looks like. Young technology and young faces, energetic, even frenetic. Insanely focused on launching a rocket soon. So this is the integration area. Diana Alcindi fled from war-torn Iraq when she was 14. She's now 25, about the average age here at Virgin Orbit. She is a propulsion engineer, a young rocket scientist, and a warehouse full of them inventing a new way to fly. Everything is trail and error. The plan is to launch a rocket not from a pad, but from a wing on this modified 747 jumbo jet. But really, we're the only one that very visibly that's using the airplane. Um, so it's an air launch platform. That's very unique. Monica Jan is Virgin Orbit's VP of Customer Experience. She says Virgin already has a long list of customers booked through 2021, even though it hasn't test fired a single one of these rockets. And so it hasn't made a single dime. But this space company has a billionaire backer, <laughs> the founder and leader of the global Virgin brand, Sir Richard Branson. And so Virgin Orbit is much farther along than most other aerospace startups. The competition in the commercial space industry we're seeing is so intense that you better be doing it faster and better than the other guys or you're not going to make it. Virgin's rocket building is some of the most advanced in the world we're seeing. Take for example this test piece that they gave me. It came out of their 3D printer that is like none other. This is copper and this is stainless steel and this was printed as one single solid piece. With conventional manufacturing, this would have been three pieces all welded together. These parts just came out of the printer. 
And the, uh, these are actually two end caps for two different engines. And these are going to be as strong and as durable as, as any part made by human hands? Yeah, probably stronger. Lars Hoffman, a former Air Force test pilot and SpaceX engineer, is in charge of global launch services at Rocket Lab, another rocket building startup just down the coast from Virgin in Huntington Beach, California. Rocket Lab also uses 3D printers, but much smaller ones because its rocket, the Electron, is much smaller itself, aiming to launch mini or micro satellites just to low Earth orbit. We are the only dedicated small launch provider uh, in the U.S. right now. What's really unique about Rocket Lab, though, is it's the only rocket maker in the world to also build and sell satellites. This is Photon and its chief engineer. When people think about doing space missions, they usually go out and they buy a satellite, and then they go out and they buy a rocket, and then they go out and they buy a payload, and they try to figure out how to piece it all together. We want to be the one-stop shop that does everything for you. The launch starts around $5 million, not $50 million like the other guys. And if the rocket has extra room, the price could drop well below that, especially for student space projects. Some have already. Uh, middle schools, uh, high schools, uh, universities. We've put a couple of uh, academic payloads onto orbit already. Rocket Lab is also booked through the next couple of years and also has deep pockets, already getting almost $300 million in investor money, launching monthly from New Zealand and soon NASA's Wallops Island flight facility in Virginia. That steady success and solid support puts Rocket Lab, like Virgin Orbit, well ahead of hundreds of other rocket building startups. This is Stargate. And this is Jordan Noon. Both are setting records. Stargate is the world's largest 3D metal printer, and Noon is one of the world's youngest rocket scientists to start a successful rocket building company. He builds them with a printer that needs its own two-story storehouse. The majority of the printers on the market are about one cubic foot in size, you know, as far as the parts that can come out of them. This one's a small building, you know, I, I'm standing in it right now. What's different about Stargate is that it prints entire sections of the rocket, not just small parts like other 3D printers. This one makes the rocket engine nozzle out of one piece at one time, pieces as big as 15 feet long that are more reliable because they have fewer moving parts. We target under a thousand parts for our rockets. For example, the engine you saw has just three parts on it, where traditionally that can have up to 3,000 parts and all of that is due to the printing and that all leads into that cost and lead time reduction. Noon says he'll be able to build a rocket from scratch to space in 60 days. He'll call it the Terran One. Terran meaning of the earth because it prints with materials of the earth, namely aluminum. For now, is 3D printing on Mars is going to be a bit of a different challenge. Ellie Fu is the metal expert or metallurgist here at Relativity. A couple of spools will, will make you a small uh, pressure vessel tank thing. Okay. Yeah. She's studying how to accomplish Relativity's ultimate goal to put a printer on the moon and then Mars to print parts for missions without having to wait for them from Earth. I think the reliability of actually moving to 3D printing will help human spaceflight, you know, because you're removing the potential error of humans. David Giger and Ellie Fu are both former SpaceX engineers, like their young boss. This is one of our 3D printed rocket engines. Jordan Noon is just 26 years old, already getting the attention of NASA. Relativity announced last month it will also build its Terran 1 rocket at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi and launch the rocket later this year at Pad 16 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Roger and Stan, go for landing, 3,000 feet. The Apollo Lunar Descent engines were tested there back in the day, and we're really excited to build on top of that heritage. Now, there was one facility Eric could not get access to while in California. We'll have that story and more right after this. Stay with us. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. Last week marked 50 years since the Apollo 11 mission. And to honor the historic journey to the moon, New 6 devoted an entire day to space, including sending crews to California and Texas to get a glimpse of what the future of space flight looks like. Eric Von Aken reports from outside SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. This was the first ever SpaceX Falcon 9 booster to launch and land successfully at the Cape. 
Now it sits on a street corner here in Hawthorne, California, in front of the SpaceX factory. And right here on the sidewalk on the other side of this thick glass wall is as close as we could get. For more than a month, we asked the media relations team inside this building if we could see inside this building. And for more than a month, we were told probably as long as there wasn't a launch when we visited. Well, SpaceX did end up launching the week we visited in June, and so we were not allowed inside. Very few news crews are. Tours are given, apparently. We spotted dozens of families with strollers filing into the warehouse past armed security guards dressed in all black that looked like they were picked for a movie role. CBS News recently got a tour and an interview with SpaceX's chief operating officer, Gwyn Shotwell. People have said we are crazy since we started. Shotwell said SpaceX is pushing for a 2022 launch to Mars and then a manned mission just two years later in the gigantic stainless steel spacecraft under construction called Starship. You want a backup strategy? Maybe a couple of backup strategies. The moon could be one, Mars could be one. And to get there, it's well known in the aerospace industry that SpaceX runs a tight ship. Several former SpaceX workers tell us 60-hour work weeks are normal, pressure and deadlines are intense, and if a project falls behind schedule, the lowest producers can find themselves out of a job in one sudden swoop. You work here? Please refer all inquiries to media at SpaceX.com. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the official statement. You can't say anything. Yes. These are for all inquiries to media at SpaceX.com. We just want to know, what's it like working here? Please refer all inquiries <laughs> to media at SpaceX.com. <laughs> and still, there is almost cult-like loyalty. We just want to know what it's like to work here. Um, it's good. Yeah, it's I really good. like it. Loyalty from workers proud to show up at work with their CEO's other venture, Tesla. Loyalty from fans. Yes, yes. Professional, one, two, three. Who ranks SpaceX just as high as the Hollywood sign or Rodeo Drive on their LA must-see list. Why do you want to take a tour? Okay, uh, I want to see where I'm going to work at someday. No, <laughs> and loyalty from people who would give anything for that pressure and deadlines and long hours and the chance to make history in spaceflight as SpaceX has done so many times already. It's revolutionary, honestly. Like, it's amazing. And while Eric could not get access to tour SpaceX, anchor Ginger Gadsden was able to check out Boeing's CST-100 Starliner at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Inside Johnson Space Center's vehicle mock-up room sits a life-size model of one of the vessels which will take astronauts to the International Space Station. Boeing's Crew Space Transport, or CST-100 Starliner. Flight Director Richard Jones knows the inner workings of the Starliner as well as the astronauts. Jones is a common link between two generations of NASA. And liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. As a shuttle flight director, he gave the go-ahead command for the final shuttle launch. And so it's a capsule. It's got seats within it that can take, uh, take that crew back and forth to the space station. It can carry cargo. Uh, it's very functional. It, from the standpoint that it's a capsule, it, um, it's maneuverable just like any spacecraft, but once it's in the atmosphere, maybe that's where it's a little bit different. That experience will now be utilized by Jones as he directs flight operations for the next generation of space exploration. While the Starliner is a capsule and bears a striking resemblance to the Apollo spacecraft, that's pretty much where the similarities end. For one, Starliner is designed to return on land instead of splashing down in the ocean. Parachutes and airbags will help soften the landing. And unlike the Apollo capsule, Starliner will be reusable up to 10 times. Space shuttles were the most complex machines ever built by man and had about 3,000 switches. The Starliner is built to be autonomous and has just 67 leaving astronauts to focus more on the science part of the mission. Inside the Starliner, you really get a feel for what the astronauts have to do and the space where they have to do it. First thing I do is I step on this platform first. For the untrained, getting in and out of the space vehicle wasn't that bad. Once inside right. though, and then you're going something. to get to know your fellow astronauts here, really okay. well. Keep in mind, the mission to the International Space Station from launch to docking is about six hours, not days. While all the training is now focusing on a mission to the ISS, 
Jones says he is thankful for those who came before him in the space program. Why should we all be paying attention right now? Oh, I, I think the, the biggest thing is that, one, you should be very proud, right, of what, what, this, what this nation can achieve when, you, when we put our minds to something. Now for 30 years, thousands would pack the causeways to take in the power and beauty of the space shuttle. When that program ended and rockets were the only thing blasting off from the Cape, in-person viewership took a dip. But today, as excitement builds about the future of space, more and more people are heading out. Photojournalist Paul Giorgio shows us one of the best places to take in a launch. Oh, it's going to be so exciting. It just is going to be beautiful. Welcome to Space View Park in Titusville, Florida. Space View Park is directly across the Indian River from uh, Kennedy Space Center, Launch Complex 39A. Uh, our pier points directly at 39A. It's, it's a great place to watch the launch from. In fact, I call this the front row of the balcony for a rocket launch. Straight out, that white tower is the water tower. The black tower to the right of it is the launch pad. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful setting here, and I expect it to be spectacular. If I would wear a green shirt, green for go. My thing is to share the knowledge, right there. What I do is stand around out here, explain things to the tourists. Okay. This park was designed to point to pad 39A, and the black tower is the launch pad. To me, it's just an ordinary launch. For many of these people, though, it's a once in a lifetime experience. Hand out little booklets that I've created to give them a bit of a souvenir. No. Get a brochure. Sure. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, this is just my little laptop computer. Um, this is the world's most important cable. It goes from the earphone jack into my little guitar amplifier. With more of the human adventure across our solar system and beyond. And it's what I use to provide the launch audio for the people here in the park. So this was going to be the first night launch of the Falcon Heavy. So we decided to come down and see it. I've had goosebumps about this for weeks. <laughs> oh, it's going to be really good. It's going to get really loud. You're going to feel it in your chest. It's going to really rumble. Oh, I think it's just going to be fabulous. I can't wait to see the sky light up. Yes! And to feel that uh, rumble through the earth. It's, it just makes me feel good. God, I love speak. When the people come Thank up to me out. as they're leaving the park, thanks for coming out, and tell me what it meant to them. Thank you very much, Ozzy. Happy to help. Thank you. We've come all the way from England. In fact, we were here <laughs> uh -huh. a, year, a year ago, last uh -huh. June, June, early June, and you were here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for coming back. Yeah. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much You're for your welcome. time. You're <laughs> welcome. Okay. <laughs> Hope you get some sleep. Thank you. Hope to see you again. <laughs> and that's our show for tonight. I just never get tired of it. <laughs> I love to watch things go up. And if you'd like to watch a thing, a rocket, go up in person, there is actually a launch tonight. A SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket will be sending cargo to the International Space Station launch time scheduled for 7.35 p.m. For complete space coverage, just head to our website, clickorlando.com space. I'm Justin Mormuth. Have a great Sunday.